So the last video in the set deals with cluster analysis. So it's an alternative uh, to ordination. It's a different type of visualization uh, where you build dendrograms uh, to show uh, distances. And um, there are lots of techniques that do that. Uh, and you can classify them roughly into bottom-up or top-down methods. So the bottom-up start with the closest two points usually and build the tree from there. So you start with two points and then you add another point and you add another point and so on. Versus the top-down methods, k-means, partitioning among midoids, there you start with the entire data set and you uh, divide it up and it finds an optimal solution for n clusters. And cluster analysis actually does address a slightly different objective than any of what we have covered before. So it deals with classification and it allows you to come up with clusters. So if you have a data set that is not grouped yet, uh, if you just have measurements, um, let's say species compositions, and you want to come up with uh, an ecosystem classification, that is the technique of choice. So cluster analysis makes clusters, finds clusters. So it uses a slightly different method of uh, visualization here. So if we have an ordination, uh, my distances are implied by the distances among my points. Um, and here uh, in a dendrogram, I group points by uh, distance as well. And my y-axis here is distant. So for example, my red points are relatively close to each other. So that distance here, so the vertical length of this bridge here, reflects uh, that distance and points that are uh, quite far apart from each other, they get a uh, long distance. And then depending on the number of groups that you want, you can objectively cut your tree at any point. So if you want two groups, you would make the cut here. If you want three groups, you can make the cut here. Um, so that would leave uh, that one point out, which may be this one here. So you would have a blue, a green, and a red group, and so on. So dendrograms are just like ordinations, they are imperfect representations of um, distances and they also have stress uh, in them and I can illustrate this quite nicely with one of the clustering methods that's called a nearest neighbor method. Um, so if you start with your distance matrix uh, that looks like this, so these are my observations and then I calculate my distances which could be Bray-Curtis, Euclidean, Mahalanobis, uh, whatever you pick. Um, I start with the smallest distance, right? And uh, so in this case, that's a one here uh, that reflects my three points. So we're starting with a really simple example, trying to build a dendrogram for this. So the distance between the blue and the red, uh, that's just one. And I can start with that and I plot my distance here on my axis. So that axis is sometimes left out, but it is there, so you can request it. Um, that is your distance metric that is uh, in that table. But then you see I immediately get a problem for the next branch of my tree. So in the nearest neighbor method, I'm just looking for the next smallest distance. That would be a two. So I would do the blue to the green and add my green point to the dendrogram. But it's not quite right. Uh, so I could also, you know, the distance between the green and the red point here, they are indicated as two as well now, but really it's 2.4. So that's not an optimal solution. Um, so it's a very basic uh, clustering method that you can also do by hand, uh, but it's not widely used. It's also prone to chaining. So if you have points that are kind of in an arc or grouped that way, so sometimes you get points that are very distant, uh, different ends from the plot, added together by this uh, nearest neighbor procedure. That's something that's chaining. People don't like that. So you try to figure out techniques that don't have those properties. So there's now a whole cluster of, uh, uh, of techniques that you can use. So for example, the average or centroid technique, or there's another variant that's called an unweighted pairwise group means with arithmetic average or something like that. Um, so there, there's a bunch of techniques that are quite similar. They, they all find compromises. Um, for example, in this case, it's not a two, it's not a 2.4, it's something in between. Uh, so you can do that. So that would be an average clustering technique. The centroid actually looks at the center of gravity of a point. So you could think about these points in multidimensional space. Where would they have their center of gravity? And that's your basis for distance calculation. So that distance to the next point, which is the closest. 
So those are all bottom-up uh, agglomerative clustering techniques that uh, I mentioned in the beginning. And so you start with uh, just a pair and you add more. So another of these agglomerative uh, techniques is Ward's minimum variance clustering. That's also a very good uh, technique and very widely used. It's often the default for clustering functions in R. And um, the way that works is uh, you try to minimize the variance within clusters. So if you have no clusters at all, you start basically with a within cluster variance of zero. And now you want to create a cluster that really gives you the smallest increase in variance over zero. And that would, of course, be the two points that are closest to each other. And um, so you calculate that as a distance between, in this case, the red point and the green point. Uh, you square that, so that's your variance. And then in step two, you repeat this. So you now find another two points. This could be between the first one and the and another point, or it could be two completely different points. So in this case, we have two completely different points. So we have now the variance based on the difference of those two, uh, plus the variance based on the difference of uh, the other two points. So that is still the minimal increase. So you have to find what's the minimal increase in variance. And in my step three here, uh, so my decision in this case was to combine combine uh, those two groups. So now you actually have uh, a lot of distances within my cluster. So the blue to the purple, the blue to the green, the blue to the red, the purple to the blue, the purple to the red, and the green to the red. So those are all my combinations. So if those are still, if that is your best choice to have all those variances as the next minimal increase, then that would be the next cluster that would be built. But it could also be something else. It could be these two points, right? So depending on what whatever gives you the minimal distance is the, uh, is the next clustering step. But it's, uh, and it's also a bottom-up approach. So you start with no clusters and you end up with, um, with a full data set as a last step. And then you also have a number of uh, top-down uh, clustering approaches. So what that means is you don't build your dendrograms up from the bottom through agglomeration, but you start with the entire data set uh, at once. And one of the most popular is the k-means uh, method here. So you have to actually predefine how many clusters you want. Um, so in this case, I want three. And in order to find the optimal solution, you just start with cluster centers randomly put into your multivariate space. And then in the next step, what you do is you look which observations are closest to these cluster centers. So the ones that I colored blue here are closest to the first center, the uh, red ones closest to the red center, and so on and so forth. And then what I do in the next step, I move the center right to the new cluster center of the observations uh, that I colored here. Now. Once you've done this, uh, you do this recursively. So you do this again. So when I classify which ones are the closest. And now this blue one will also capture those two red ones here. And the red one uh, will capture everything in the vicinity except this particular one. But this is a recursive process. So you'll see that very quickly uh, you get an optimal solution. So you'll see in the next step what happens if I move that red center over here, the green center a little bit further there, the blue center a little bit further there. Now the red one will capture that point here and then I'm at a stable solution. So I don't find clusters that are any more natural than that. We can look at how this works actually. Uh, there's a little animation. So you see we start uh, with kind of a random situation and now this moves around. It does look a little bit simplistic um, because I'm only doing it with three points and two dimensions, but you can imagine that this works in multivariate space with uh, many groups potentially. So it is a very efficient and clever clustering technique to find natural groups. Um, so there are other techniques like this, for example, palm partitioning around midoids. Um, midoids are like these means here, except that they have to be a point. So it's like a mean, but this particular technique, instead of uh, having a separate centroid, uh, it just jumps from point to point to find uh, group means. And then a TSNE here that stands for T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. Uh, that's kind of a complicated uh, technique that I don't fully understand, but I do appreciate it. It's, um, it's very effective for high dimensionality problems. So if you have hundreds or thousands of variables, uh, 
these techniques can struggle with this. This one here will usually work something out that looks as sensible, uh, so it's a good clustering technique, but it is computer intensive. So, uh, so this this one actually chokes on large data sets. It's designed for high dimensionality, so many variables. But um, if you have a lot of observations, then this one might not manage it uh, unless you really have patience. Now, all these top-down clustering techniques have one thing in common. Uh, you have to kind of decide in advance how many clusters you need. And um, that is actually an easier problem for humans than for machines. Uh, so it's actually very easy uh, to look at the ordination and just say, OK, well, this looks like four or five clusters and uh, then just request this for the top-down clustering methods. But there is some guidance provided as well. So what you can do is you can look at runs with different numbers of clusters, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. And you can look at the variance within clusters. So the more clusters you have, the more similar your observations will be. And um, that represents more homogeneous clusters. So the lower, the better. But there will be an inflection point here. So where adding more clusters does not really make a big difference in terms of um, within variance. So in that case, I would choose three clusters because that levels off after the third cluster. Another one is a gap statistic. That's basically the variance between observations, but you also use a reference data set. So the reference data set is a random positioning of your points in an ordination, and then you subtract the variance between clusters from that random positioning. And so where that is lowest, um, that can be an optimal number of clusters. Um, I find this one doesn't always work. Um, our mileage may vary there in getting guidance from uh, this gap statistic. And then another one is the silhouette coefficient. That's, a, that's based on average distance between clusters. And the way that is calculated is that for every point, you calculate how close is it to its own cluster and how far away is it to other clusters. And um, uh, then on, on this basis, you can calculate an uh, average distance between clusters. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, if you want, you can uh, look it up how it exactly works, but that is the general principle. So in that case, I would pick something like four clusters. So these uh, top-down methods, um, they're usually good for high dimensionality, large sample sizes, and that is also an active area of research. So there's lots of uh, techniques that are being developed and that, uh, that are getting published. Uh, so it's worth to check this out occasionally. So I included uh, some of those in the lab. Uh, you can try all this out. Um, you can see if you can find optimal number of clusters and so on. So with that, you have everything that you need to know for lab five. Um, so please go ahead and uh, try all these techniques out.